for coming on a lovely Friday afternoon to listen to this topic. I hope that I can um, start a good discussion about it, give you some information that will be useful to you, uh, because it is, a, of course, a very important topic that affects, I think, our entire nation. And I wanted to try and cover two sides. One is the importance of opioids in pain control, and the other is the propensity that they have to create addiction. And as I started to prepare my talk, this came on the news, the death of Prince from accidental overdose of opioid painkiller. And sadly, this is not at all an unusual occurrence. It happened to be somebody we hear about. And he, in a way, is a prototypical case because as the New York Times article says, he started not because we think sometimes stars you know, use drugs, play with drugs, but because of he had hip pain and it was pretty chronic. He was put on a drug called fentanyl. And even though he had a reputation for clean living, he developed dependence on these medications because of the pain treatment. And he was like 112 pounds and he overdosed and, and, and died from it. So this is sadly a very common story. It's not the only way that people die, but it is one of the ways that people die. And it shows you the horn of the dilemma. It feels sometimes like with opioids, we have made a deal with the devil that on the one hand, they are our very best tools for pain control in spite of a lot of other attempts. And while we have other tools that work, they are really the most powerful, the best ones we have. At the same time, they are highly addictive, or some of them are highly addictive. And I, I can't here tell you that I have an answer to how to solve this dilemma. But I can tell you that science does know some things that maybe the world at large has not completely yet incorporated, and that our hope is that that knowledge will be the basis for coming up with both shorter term and longer term strategies to combat this problem. So first a word about the rising epidemic. 47,000 people in 2014 died of drug overdose. Uh, that's, that means by the time we leave this room, five to six new people will have died from drug overdose. The huge majority of them will be from opioids, either prescription or heroin. So that is a huge, huge number of unnecessary deaths. A lot of them are young. A lot of them are teenagers. It's you know, very sad and devastating. Specifically, you can see the rate of rise, which to me is really stunning. Between 2001 and 2014, the number went from 6,000 to 20,000. That's a huge jump. And in 2012, there were almost 260 million opioid prescriptions written in this country. That means pretty much every adult can walk around with a bottle of strong opioids in their, in their pocket every year. Why? Because about 100 million Americans are diagnosed with chronic pain. Chronic pain being defined as something that is ongoing, debilitating, and lasts more than six months. And as I said, the opioids are the most effective. But we have a vicious cycle then that starts because pain gets you pr opioid prescriptions. It leads also to negative emotions. It leads to more pain, which of course also demands more opioids. But removing the opioids can also cause negative feelings, can cause depressive-like symptoms, and can cause actually more bodily demand for more opioids and exacerbate the pain itself. So while they work, they also work to keep themselves going as a need for the individual. So I mentioned fentanyl in the case of Prince. Fentanyl is one of the drugs whose use has gone up very dramatically. It's a very powerful drug, 80 to 100 times more than morphine, which had been a pretty standard <coughs> opioid for a long time. Um, and it was originally brought along as a, an anesthetic in the operating room, and it has made its way out as a you know, a pill and an injection and a powder and a lot of different ways. And in, in itself, by itself, the rate of death in one year has doubled with fentanyl alone. So 
the biological effects of fentanyl are like heroin. So if you hear about heroin abuse and you hear about fentanyl, they are like really similar. Um, but it, uh, and it can be used in a variety of ways. And there are many analogs on the market. And I'll come back to them. But what is interesting is some of them work extremely fast. And we'll come back to that, why that means something. And some of them are very chronic. They're put on a patch, and they keep going all the time. It's being released all the time. And we'll come back and talk about why that may have some meaning. And some are designed specifically for people who are already tolerant and still have breakthrough pain, for example, with cancer. And I'm not belittling the seriousness of that. If you're already on opioids and you're tolerant and your pain is very strong, what do you do? Well, there are drugs that are given to overcome huge tolerance, but that gives you an idea how powerful they can be. And there are still versions that are 10,000 times more potent than morphine. So these are really loaded guns. There are many others that you've heard about. Oxycontin, one is very known. It's called hillbilly heroin, for whatever reason. It can be made uh, as a derivative of the poppy plant. And what happens is you get euphoria, you get pain relief, but you also get these side effects that are typical of many opioids. You get sedation, you get breathing, gets labored at a particular dose, after a particular dose. Pupils get very tiny, become pinpoint. People can go into a coma and they can die. So a lot of these originally came from this lovely flower, the poppy, that, that has a, that has a, what happened? I don't want to do that. And you know, it has a pod. And this juice here, the poppy juice, has all these chemicals in it that are morphine, opium, black tar. And then they can get and heroin. And heroin, morphine, and opium come extracted right out of here. And with slight modifications, you can make the classical opiates. Opiates are usually the extracts of the poppy. Opioids are. Drugs that are either made or, as you will hear, made by us or made by industry um, that are opiate-like. But opiates and opioid drugs are all either from that poppy or very similar to it. And they have a chemical structure. Don't let it scare you. But I just want to show you this is a small molecule. That's the classic morphine molecule. It has um, this dark thing is like perpendicular, so it has a 3D shape to it. And Slight modifications of it in a couple of sites make it into heroin. Other slight modification make it into oxycodone. A lot of them are very similar chemical cousins of each other. And so they had such a specific shape. And they looked like nothing in our brain, like you hear about serotonin or noradrenaline or dopamine. These were distinct enough from them chemically that people started to think maybe what recognizes them in our brain is unique as well. And there was the hypothesis that we have in our brain a special receptor, a special molecule that recognizes them in a unique way. And back in 1973, a several groups, one, I'm showing you one of them from Johns Hopkins, Saul Snyder, demonstrated the existence of a special brain site that recognizes the opiates and no other drugs. And, but we didn't know the gene. We just knew the traces. We knew that those drugs went and bound to it. We didn't have the technology. It took another almost 20 years for people to actually clone the genes, actually get a sequence from the genes of animals and humans and know the actual structure of the genes that code for that protein, the opiate receptor. So what is that protein? It took another 20 years, in 2012, to us to be able to visualize it. This is a so-called crystal structure. When you purify it into an enough purity that you can make a crystal out of it, you use can def different fancy technologies to image it. And what you can see is it's made up of these strands, like you know, curly hair. Um, there are seven of them. And they are set up to go up and down, up and down. And between them, if you look at them from the top down, they form a channel, a hollow tube. And this is where opiates go in from the top and sit, come from the outside, 
and sit in here and bind to the walls of the protein. And in the process, make it shift a little bit. So these, these are embedded. So this is a wall of a cell. This is the outside of the cell, the inside of the cell. This opiate receptor is embedded. This is a bunch of lipid on either side. So it's pretty fluid. And when something comes and sits in it, shifts enough. When it shifts, something on the inside of it shifts, the inside part shifts. And when that happens, then the stuff on the inside is able to grab onto another protein. And that's how the message gets in from the outside to the inside. One protein grabs onto another, onto another, and it changes the activity of the cell. It changes sometimes the genetics of the cell. It changes a bunch of things. And as it turns out, from cloning and other data, we also learned that there wasn't one opiate receptor, but three. The original one was called mu for the morphine receptor. It loves morphine than, more than others. But there were two others, kappa and delta, all along the same general design of having these seven transmembrane areas and this configuration that recognizes opiates. So where were they in the brain? This is actually the work from my husband's lab, Stan Watson, who did the first mapping of these receptors in the brain of a rat. You can see that the, the, the bright spots are where the opiates are sitting um, onto the brain when you give them. And you can see they sit in patches. This is part of the brain that controls mo movement. Um, but they sit also very brightly in areas that control pleasure. They sit in the cortex that controls thought. So in fact, and we can see them inside of cells now with better technology. In fact, they are all over the brain. And that is important to know because when you're giving the drugs, it's talking to receptors all over the brain. It's talking into the cortex. This is a, a, a mouse or a rat brain, the nose, the tail. But it's talking to all these cell groups here, like every one of those outlined areas. This area here, for example, controls breathing. It can control respiration, digestion, movement, as well as pain, as well as pleasure and thought. So it is having a very big impact. And each one of the three receptors I mentioned is very widespread and interacts very broadly with a lot of areas. Moreover, with time and with increased sophistication, we have learned that there are many small variants on each one of these receptors. They have different, uh, what, what's called splicing. So the gene gets cut and pasted together slightly differently. They have slightly different tails on the inside. It looks confusing. I'm mentioning it because out of this complexity, there may be opportunity that I want to come back to at the end and talk about. But suffice it to say that is information that we get from our animal research is also present in the human brain. This is a visualization with PET imaging from a colleague at Michigan, where you can see in the human brain the binding of opiates and how it changes with pain, for example. So very early on, we, I, for example, asked, why would our brain and the poppy recognize the same molecule? What's that all about? You know, why, are we, why do we have a poppy-like brain? Uh, and it, it, it turns out that it is sort of an accident of evolution, that the poppy plant happened to make something that mimics something that we have in our own brain by accident. And because something about the structure of those products of the poppy are similar enough, they can fool the opiate receptors. And it's as if you have this receptor in your brain as if it's a lock. We still didn't know what the natural key for it was. But we found this other key that happens to be similar enough that it fits and opens it. It's not identical, but it's similar enough. In fact, we never have found true morphine in our brain. We're not a poppy. It doesn't seem like we make real morphine. But we make something similar enough. And that is what the receptor is there for. And this just happens to be the imposter, the opiates, that fool our endogenous system. And so as Lynn said very early on, we had done work in animals that showed that the brain had something like opium in it. it that 
responded to brain stimulation, responded to stress, got turned on and shut down our pain sensitivity. And we argued that there is adaptation in that, that if you know, the tiger is running after you and you hurt your ankle, you don't want to feel that pain. You want to keep running. So stress turns on these opiates to help you survive for a while until so you're, you, have, you have something in your brain that lets you change your level of pain response as needed to cope in the world. Eventually, the chemical nature of that got described in a meeting here, you can see me here, a million years ago before many of you were born, in 1975. And so it was not that many people in that meeting. Uh, I was a baby. And, and this young man here called John Hughes talked about taking the brains of, um, I think it was cows from a slaughterhouse, and using the information we had come up with in our animal studies about where it must be in the brain, and then chemically isolating it, and isolated two chemicals that he called enkephalins, which means from the head. And he actually said there are two of them. They are very similar. They're called met enkephalin because they have methionine or lu enkephalin. They have leucine, met and lu enkephalin. Very soon, I won't bore you with the details, but very soon thereafter, many, many labs were, it was really an exciting time, many labs were involved. And we figured that, that actually our bodies have many, many of these molecules that interact with our opiate receptors. In fact, they come packaged in three genes, three families. One is called pro-opiomelanocortin, or POMC, pro-enkephalin, meaning before enkephalin, and pro dynorphin uh, And you don't need to worry about the words except to say that these are genes that then eventually, that each house one or more copy of these smaller stretches of molecules called peptides, so not big proteins, smaller ones, that turn on our natural opiate receptor. And there is a process where a given gene gets cut up by enzymes into smaller and smaller pieces. And all of these are then active. And this is a very cool one. I've spent a lot of my life working on it. And that is because this is one molecule that has in it a stress hormone, ACTH, an endorphin called beta endorphin, and something that controls feeding. So if you're a frog and you are, oh, and skin color. So if you're a frog and you're being threatened in the wild, you don't want to feel pain, you don't want to eat right now, and you want to change your skin color to change with the environment. And so you sense the stress. It's a stress response that changes. You know, you see them, how they get splotchy and change their color? One molecule is a precursor to all these genes that do all these jobs. And we have it in our brain. And it controls both pain, stress, and feedings. Very cool, very efficient little design. And we, again, my husband's lab mapped the, the, the three genes that now have the opiates, or they were called now the endorphins or the endogenous morphine, the natural <coughs> morphines, map them in the brain. And like their receptor, they are all over the brain, some more rare than others, but not just in pain places, in pleasure places, in cognition places, in autonomic places. And eventually, there are ways, this is from Sabatini's lab, showing how the receptor and the natural endorphins talk to each other. So these patches are the patches I showed you earlier that are the receptors, and the green are all our endorphins hovering around them and interacting with them. And we went back, and we learned, we know how to cut and paste. Many years ago, again, how to cut and paste different pieces of receptors and try both the natural and the unnatural opioids. And long story short, we figured that where the, endorphin, the opioids sit in this pocket here, and how the natural endorphins sit. They, use, they dangle in, they use the same pocket, but they also are bigger, so they tickle the outside in a different way. So the point is that we know a lot about this biology in a very molecular way. We know what we have in our brains, who talks to what, and how this opiate fool the systems, how the opiate drugs fool the system. So why do we have this system? What does it do, you know, other than cause trouble for, you know, for addiction? 
Well, people have all kinds of crazy ideas. I love to see what people say about them. First of all, somebody tattooed in Keflam on their hand. <laughs> because a lot of people think it's the origin of happiness. It's the origin of the runner's high. Lucene and Kaflin, its cousin, is in sad tears, but not other kind. Like, if onion is making you cry, you don't have Lucene and Kaflin. But if you're sad, Lucene and Kaflin is in the tears, apparently. And as I mentioned to you, we had originally done some work where we electrically stimulated the brains of rats and showed that it relieves pain. So does it work in humans? So we asked that question very, very early on about whether it's relevant to pain. So this is yours truly in days gone by in, a, in sort of an early example of translational research where we took the finding from animals to humans who were suffering from really severe chronic intractable pain like severe cancer and they were not being helped. And we aimed electrodes with the help of a neurosurgeon specifically to a brain site that we had discovered worked in animals. And we would take out the electrode and work with the patient, with them, stimulating them until we found the right conditions. And lo and behold, pain would disappear. Very purely, very nicely. And it would stay gone for hours. And then you can turn it off. You know, you turn it off after a few minutes. You turn it back on. Once you find the site, you can internalize this wire to the inside. And now it's a transducer. You can turn it on. And the patient can stimulate his own brain and get rid of pain. And a lot of people have done this. There's been like 60 different studies on this. It works, but it's, I mean, it's brain surgery. It's not you, something you give to 100 million people. But it is definitely says something about what happens. And one of the things we showed very early on is that we release endorphins when we do that. When we stimulate the brain, endorphins show up in the fluid inside the brain. So, so that means we do have, what our original guess was, that we do have our own natural opiates, and that one of the things they do is that they provide pain relief. So presumably, the drugs that we, we give people, the opiate analgesic, are mimicking that natural system. They are acting at all the places that we know respond to our natural painkillers. And so the, you know, in the brain, in the periphery, in the spinal cord, some go into the brain and some don't. And the question is, if you're doing something to mimic the natural system, why are you in trouble? Why are we in trouble? And we're in trouble for all these reasons. We get tolerance, we get dependence, we get addiction. And there are many mechanisms involved in that. I don't want to you know, bore you with all the details of them. But the thing, the tolerance is when you need more and more drugs. Dependence is when if you remove the drug, the person is really sick. And addiction is all the very strong compulsive drive to keep using the drug. <coughs> and the question again is why do these problems emerge? And there are lots of reasons, and I'm just going to tell you a few. One is that I've been showing you that it's all over the brain. And so when we give it peripherally, we're not just activating the pain control system. We're activating reward, respiration, um, in fact, also all over the body, the liver, the heart, et cetera. So that's one big reason. They go all over. The other big reason is that we usually have a feedback process. So when, we're, when you stimulate or stress stimulates your natural endorphins, and one cell releases them and sends them across this gap to where the receptor is. The receptor has ways of letting that original cell know that it heard the message. And it says, enough, I got it. And so this cell shuts down. But if you're giving the opiates from the outside, that message is useless. Because this is not where you're getting your goodies. You're getting them artificially. So you've lost that feedback tool. So the next thing that happens is the receptor gets overwhelmed and adapts. Some of it goes down. Some of it changes the way it couples. It goes through a lot of biochemical, physical changes. That's when you get uh, uh, tolerance. That's, that's why the same dose stops working, because it's fighting you. It's trying to fight that deluge, unregulated deluge. And that is why you put a patch and you never let go. You're going to get a lot of tolerance and a lot of dependence. And that means then when you remove that outside, this has been shutting down, shutting down, trying not to make more, because the receptor is telling it to stop. 
It's not effective when the drug is bypassing it. But you remove the drug, and now this system is shut down. So you've lost both your drug and your natural opiates, and you go into withdrawal. So the other big issue that we run in trouble is the brain regulates how many cells it should hit at once. But when you give it peripherally, you hit a lot of cells at the same time. And the faster the drug, the more cell it hits at once, the more rewarding and euphoria you get. And all addicts know that. And that's why they smoke it, they, sh you know, they shoot it IV, they change it so that it's very rapidly acting. And I showed you that they make a very rapid acting fentanyl, very addicting. Uh, and, and very powerful. So among other reasons, we're bypassing the biology, we're hitting too fast. And that should give us some ideas about what not to do if we still want to treat pain, but not trigger all this good stuff that's going on. The other thing that happens is something called the therapeutic window. So if you hit pain before you hit respiration, the pain system starts to adapt. The respiration system is still not touched. And as the pain system starts to get more and more tolerant and you need more and more drug to turn off the pain, the distance between the dose that will stop your breathing and the dose that stops your pain gets narrower and narrower. And that's why people suddenly stop breathing, go into coma, and die. So the distance that starts off looking safe becomes unsafe as the tolerance, dependence, and so on go on for biological reasons. And then, of course, there is the other big elephant in the room, which is that people get addicted to this stuff. And the reason we get addicted to this stuff is because this is part of also our reward circuitry. This, I, I, I keep saying, it's all over the brain. And one of the places in the brain that it is is a very, very complex circuitry that eventually affects another transmitter called dopamine which is activated by cocaine, amphetamine, nicotine, alcohol, uh, et cetera, and the opioids modulate that and activate it. And a lot of things also go through the opioid system to, to actually increase their power. And so we have our own natural reward system, which we, of course, don't want to get rid of, but also you don't want to drive it as like crazy like you don't want to drive the pain system and make, lose control. You don't want to drive the reward system. And, but the other thing that's really important is that people are very different in how this reward system is tuned. So obviously not everybody is the same. I love this picture. <laughs> and, you know, and we need to understand this individual differences in how people react to drugs, both on the pain side, but also on the addiction side. And I currently work hard on this because only 15 to 25 percent of people who are exposed to opiates become true addicts. And the question is why are these becoming addicted and what protects the other 75 percent? We don't really quite understand that. If we knew, we could, you know, modulate our behavior about who we treat accordingly. But presumably, it's part of it. It's genetic. There are personality different and different ways to become addicted. And I want to quickly touch on that. So to make sense of why different, you know, of, of the complexity on the addiction side, you need, we need to remember that there are stages to the addictive process. So first, you have to be exposed to the drug. Either somebody gives it to you because you have pain, or you're, you're trying it because it's fun, or it's interesting, or your friend is doing it, or somebody's pushing it. Now, some people try it and hate it. I'm somebody, you give me an opiate. Ah, <laughs> I don't want it. Makes me sick. So, you know, I'm, I'm not likely to become a heroin abuser. But some people totally love it the first time they take it. They feel like this is what I've been waiting for all my life. And that, that original reaction is very, very important. And then, but you don't automatically become an addict until you take it over and over again. And there is some, a process, a biochemical process in your body called transition to addiction. It takes repeated long exposure. And you get physical dependence. You get psychological dependence. And then comes the part that even if you see the light and you say, I better stop, there is a whole biology to stopping. And actual true depression and very strong negative affect that comes from it 
So that initial rush of joy and happiness and euphoria is not what's driving you anymore. What is driving you is the dysphoria of not being on it. Very anxiety, very depressive, awful. People feel awful without it. And even if you manage to live through that, there is the issue of relapse. And people think of relapse as weakness. I can show you rats that relapse. Rats relapse for many different reasons. And one very interesting reason is all the associations. So we have rats that make associations to a light, to a place. And as soon as they're in that light, they have the urge to take the drug. We can show that that's different between different genetic backgrounds of rats. So if you love coffee and you love Starbucks, are you in love with that mermaid? If you would love to see that mermaid, even if there is no coffee next to it, see, he knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> you are called the sign tracker. And you are more prone to relapse, sadly, at least for coffee, than if the mermaid only means there is a Starbucks. So, so all of these are psychological, biochemical, genetic differences between people that make some people more prone to addiction than others. And we do understand them. We know a lot about them. So temperament is a very big difference. Uh, and you, uh, this is my question. If you want to relax, do you want to knit? Or do you want to skydive? No. <laughs> well, it turns out that rats also have preferences. And we have skydiving animals and knitting animals <laughs> that we have actually been breeding for 10 years. And it's really genetic. It breeds true. And it predicts all kinds of behavior, including whether you get addicted to opiates and to cocaine, and whether you relapse and what makes you relapse. And it defines different paths to drug abuse. So these guys, uh, I'm going to skip that. So basically, they are about things that we call propensity for externalizing disorders in humans at the extreme, not everybody. At the extreme, if you have one kind of temperament, you might have the kind of problems where people have show impulsivity, aggression, sensation seeking, and become, have conduct disorders, antisocial behavior, and substance abuse. And with another kind of genetically determined temperament, you might be much more prone to depression, anxiety, obsession, and, and so on. And those differences in, in propensity to internalizing and externalizing disorders, they're not one gene. There's a whole bunch of genes involved in that. And it's modifiable. But they also affect how your brain responds to the drug, not only when the drug is on board, but after you've removed the drug. So you remove the drug. The drug changes the brain. It changes it differently in the skydiving rat from the knitting rat. So that means that you really need different treatments and different strategies to prevent them from relapsing, for example. So we really have to take those differences seriously. So I want to go back now and say, can science help us? Well, we need to obviously, I hope you can see that various characteristics of the drug matter. Does it hit fast? Does it hit slow? Does it last long? Does it last a short period of time? Is it an opioid or a non-opioid? All of this matters. And should we be going all the way, giving the strongest drug, the fastest drug, the toughest drug for everything you know, very early? So you have to tailor the use of the drugs much more strategically and give the absolute essential stuff, but not too much. So sometimes weaker is better. Some, let, you know, even though somebody is suffering, if the drug takes a little while to mount and its effect and cut down the pain, it might be less addicting. That might not be a bad price to pay. That, so that speed of action is important. But then there is also the chance a little bit downstream to create better drugs, even within the opioid family. So remember I told you that there are these splices that affect the shape of the receptor and how it talks to the inside. And those are in different places. They might be in the pain system more than in the reward system. And so the opportunity is to design drugs that don't necessarily couple to all the proteins on the inside, but to one path versus another. It's possible to do that. It's a concept called biased signaling. Hasn't been quite yet applied in the opioid field. But the idea is you design the drugs much more biochemically, strategically, so that 
you are affecting more receptors in one particular part of the brain and for a different kind of duration and effect. So that's the pipe dream. But the idea is you are sort of producing the equivalent of my brain stimulation and targeting more a particular type of place and a particular type of brain circuit to more selectively affect the pain and not everything else. Uh, the other really important thing, as I showed you with the skydiving and the knitting and so on, is to think about who's receiving the pain treatment and what stage they are in. You might have very different strategies from somebody who's a terminal patient suffering horribly, and you really, at this point, are not going to worry about addiction. <coughs> You're worrying about being humane with them. Versus, uh, or somebody who has a very severe but acute pain, they broke their leg, you can give them a strong opiate because you don't think they're gonna, you're going to need to give it to them for 10 years. Versus somebody who has really chronic, unrelenting pain, you have to think a lot harder about how to tailor that treatment. Adolescents in particular are a big problem. I don't have time to tell you about it, but they are remodeling their brain. And they are extremely prone, both at that temperament, psychological level, at the molecular level, and in their reactivity to the drugs. And the way that your body handles the drug, there is a genetics to that. All the different phases of drug abuse, we may need to think about the people who are already addicted, how we deal with that versus the people that we want to prevent from becoming addicted and how we prepare for that. So you can't just say to everybody, stop, because they will just go divert, do something else, or kill themselves. So I guess my final point is that really, even though precision medicine gets talked about mostly for cancer, there, I cannot think of a better candidate to think very actively about tailoring the combination of what we know about the patient, their genetic, their personality, their history, the kind of pain, the kind of drugs, and doing a much better job of helping the people who need it while avoiding as much as possible killing people or addicting people who don't need it. Thank you.